Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Cambria Allen Ratzloff, and I'm the Corporate Governance Director of the UAW Retiree Medical Benefits Trust. So far, we've heard about the importance of diversity and representation in the governance structures that form the backbone of our financial system. Next, we turn to the providers of capital to hear how they're integrating diversity considerations throughout the investment chain. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, has become a leading issue for investors, from directing our beneficiaries' hard-earned assets to our stewardship activities that ensure those assets are protected for the long term. Diverse boards make better, more thoughtful decisions and provide more effective oversight of management. Diverse management teams outperform teams that are not diverse across several key dimensions, including profitability and innovation. This is perhaps common sense. When you pull your talent from the biggest pool possible and then provide that talent with a supportive and inclusive environment where they can put their skills to use to the best of their abilities, you get better outcomes. The challenges some companies are facing in attracting and retaining talent as we recover from the pandemic only underscores this point. So diversity and inclusion have become a leading focus area for us, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because our experiences as allocators and the data available to us have shown time and time again that diversity and inclusion are inseverable from our ability to most effectively direct our beneficiaries' capital to its highest value use. CalPERS and CalSTRS have taken an important leadership role in integrating diversity throughout the investment and stewardship processes. And now we'll hear from two more leaders who are making great strides in this area. New York State Comptroller Thomas P. DiNapoli is sole fiduciary for the $254 billion New York State Common Retirement Fund, the third largest pension fund in the U.S. Since assuming office in 2007, Tom has been a leader in DEI integration and has nearly tripled the fund's allocation to its Emerging Managers program, which now represents approximately one quarter of externally managed active mandates. Ron O'Hanley is chairman and CEO of State Street Corporation, one of the world's largest servicers and managers of institutional assets. Ron previously served as president and chief executive officer of State Street Global Advisors and sits on several boards, including the Ireland Funds, Unum Corp, and Syracuse University. Thank you both for joining us today. So first, I'm going to start out with Tom. So as trustee of a large diversified portfolio, how do you assess the diversity, equity, and inclusion policies and performance of the over 200 managers and partners you work with? Cambria, it's great to be with you and with Ron and with CalPERS and CalSTRS. Uh, we always appreciate the uh, collaborative effort we have with our colleagues in, uh, in California. And thank you, Cambria, for a good setup to, uh, to our discussion. I mean, obviously, uh, as we all understand, we're at a, a key inflection point in our American history, and uh, the investment community needs to be a part of this very important discussion about what diversity really means and what inclusion and equity means and how we integrate that uh, into all of our business activities. For uh, us in New York, uh, we have made uh, diversity one of our strategic priorities for the controls office across all divisions, not just uh, the asset management piece for uh, a number of years. So I'd like to think to a certain extent, we were already uh, on the job, but we understand that there's still a great deal of work uh, for us to do. When we talk about these issues in the context of, uh, of the investment of the, of the monies of the Common Retirement Fund, it really gets to the point you made in the introduction, which is that the data shows, the research shows that when you put a priority on diversity and asset management, you get better results. And you know, so whenever folks sometimes question, what are we doing? So we'll, it's all about the bottom line. You know, we have 1.1 million New Yorkers who depend on us for their retirement security. So any strategy, including a DEI strategy that gets us better results is key. You know, how do we try to achieve that? I, I think one of the important um, priorities that I have had, if we're, if we're asking our uh, investment partners to do right by these issues or the companies we invest in, we, we have to uh, be a model ourselves. So in terms of our investment staff, I'm very pleased to say it's probably the most diverse staff within our entire organization and for and for state government, probably one of the more diverse staff. So in my tenure, uh, I've hired three uh, chief investment officers. All three have been women because they happen to be the best. Two of the three uh, were black women, again, because they happen to be the best. But I think that set a strong message about the tone at the top about how our organization views these issues 
uh, 47% of our investment staff are women, 19% African-American, 10% Asian, 6% Hispanic, and we're always trying to do better with those numbers. And, and as you mentioned in the, the intro, we're very uh, pleased with how we've grown our uh, commitments with regard to emerging managers, not all of whom are diverse, but many of them are, and certainly for our women and minority owned numbers. So we're up to about $9 billion now in our emerging manager program and uh, $27 billion invested with women and minority owned uh, investment managers. So, you know, for us, because we do, uh, you know, so much of our investing in-house, particularly with regard to, to public equities, the fact that we are, you know, over 22% now, I think is the number of investments managed by our outside asset managers are women and minority owned firms. Uh, we're pleased with that. We're not done. And, and that's the floor. That's not the ceiling. So, you know, what we, what we have done as part of our due diligence, whenever we're, uh, particularly when we're considering a new external investment manager, but even with those of long standing, we've reached out, certainly in the wake of, of, of the reckoning after the George Floyd murder, really reminding all of our external managers what a priority we put on D, E, and I uh, policies and practices, asking for an update on what their policies and practices are, what kind of commitments that they're, they're making in that regard. So in terms of the response that we received to that request, all of our managers, we actually had a 93% response rate, which we think was pretty high. We judge that 63% of those actually have pretty strong policies. Uh, so our goal now is to really continue that effort, working on standardizing the metrics that we use to measure our external managers in terms of these issues and, and really just keep the dialogue going. So I'm pleased with what we've done so far, but it is still very much a work in progress. Great, thank you, Tom. And it's important too, because that really pushes the industry overall, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ron. Um, so State Street's been working toward positioning itself as a leader in attracting, retaining, and engaging a diverse, equitable, and inclusion, inclusive workforce as well. Um, you know, while ensuring that workers feel engaged, supported, and heard is key to retention, companies sometimes struggle to get it right. So how is State Street ensuring its commitment to supporting its workers, especially workers from groups that are traditionally underrepresented in finance? It's a, it's a great question, Cambria, and, and um, I'd like to echo the thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for the way you've set it up and uh, both your setup and Tom's comments just there are a reminder to all of us that the owners of capital um, are the ones that can set real standards here and drive real change, and both of you are doing that. And I'll come back to that later in the, uh, in the panel. Um, the, we, we've We've worked very hard. We're, we're a, a company of about uh, 39,000 employees. You know, we operate in 40 countries. Um, and uh, as we uh, communicating and hearing from our employees is very important. If there was a silver lining uh, over the last 14 months with COVID, um, it was the fact that we had to send so many employees remote and that communications and connectivity became all that much more difficult and the usual channels couldn't be relied upon. Uh, we focus a lot at State Street on what we call our ERGs, our employee resource groups, um, and those became very, very important. And the employee resource groups are, uh, there's many, many of them. Uh, some of them relate to interests. Um, some of them relate to how people identify themselves. Uh, but all of them became extremely important as a channel with which to reach out to people because there was no textbook or playbook on you know how to do a remote work during a pandemic right it had never been done before um, and uh, many of us all of us were in effect making it up on the fly but the employee resource groups became very important there uh, frankly, it caused us to think about how we as a corporation communicate to our employees and uh, made us realize that as good as we think we are and as frequent as we think we are, it's never enough and it's never good enough. Uh, and that's not a, it's not a comment on management. It's not a comment on, on our employees. It's just there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of noise, even more so when you're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, the other point about this is recognition. And recognition, again, became all that much harder 
when you're trying to do it with you know 90 ish percent of our employees actually working remotely so we actually instituted an online recognition platform called bravo uh, which has turned out to be extraordinary because it's actually um it, it's actually forced uh managers to really think about uh each day who are the employees that have done something that i should recognize sometimes they're very dramatic things sometimes they're not so dramatic but it's uh in its own way has caused a degree of inclusion that we haven't seen before having all this in place uh when uh, the George Floyd situation arose and every, we got our, all of us got ourselves to the point that this can no longer be accepted and having those channels in place uh, early on in the pandemic actually proved to be really useful because it was at that point that we recognized we need to have a virtual conversation amongst 39,000 people, again, while 90% of them are remote. And we were able to pull that off. We had town halls in one situation where there were over 6,000 people having a conversation on this, and it spawned all that much more. So it's just a reminder to all of us that um, no matter how good we are, uh, to really get at solutions, you've got to start with communications. To get at that communications, you've got to, you've really got to think about how you're knitting your people together. So Ron, is that, is that kind of the, the kind of um, spark for 10 State Street actions that uh, State Street put out, I think, last summer? Yeah, so the, the, what Cameron is referring to is uh, we published last summer um, uh, this 10 actions to promote racial equity at State Street. Um, and certainly the George Floyd situation was the catalyst for it. Uh, for me, it was, um, it became very personal because my view was, um, you know, the usual note of, you know, gee, this is terrible and it can't be accepted any longer. Um, well, I'm, I'm not disparaging those notes, at least for me personally, it wasn't enough. Uh, I, I, it caused me and my management team to think about for all the work that we've actually done on DEI, uh, and we've made some real progress in some areas, we actually haven't made anywhere near enough. And the 10 actions was about uh, what can we State Street do uh, in the communities in which we exist, starting with our own employee community, but not limited to that, uh, to make an impact here. It's not an exclusive list, uh, so not everything is on there, but it was meant to be uh, to set priorities. And the, it, there's themes around the actions. You know, one is around, we just have not seen um, the, the right advancement of employees of color in our organization. Why is that? What are we going to do about that? Another theme was we spend a lot of money. Um, we purchase a lot of things, but more importantly, um, we spend money on professional services. And if we really, uh, if we really use that spending to actually advance firms of either minority-owned firms, firms, women-owned firms, and how can we spend that money to a better end there? Third is we've uh, you know, just given our size in the industry, we have some influence in the industry. By the way, I, we're a large asset manager uh, and we're the leading servicer to asset managers. So our view was, hmm, that's a community that we can have an impact on. So that's what the 10 actions were about. Again, uh, lots of people are doing lots of things. These were the things that we wanted to focus on. And by the way, we're holding ourselves accountable. All right, so the management team is actually measured against them and the management, the senior management team is actually compensated against them. That's great. I mean, I, you know, I think flipping it this over to Tom for a bit, I mean, we've, we've talked, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about data a little later in the conversation, but, you know, being able to, to have that accountability is, is key. And that's something that I'm sure you look for in the companies you engage in, but also among your van vendors and managers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no question about it. And, you know, I, I, you know, picking up what Ron was saying, and I really salute Ron and State Street on their approach. And I think, you know, the, the tone of how Ron expressed it is important. You know, these are issues that are not new and issues that everybody's understood. But to recognize in, in a, in a, in a non-defensive way that, that, you know, we just haven't done enough and, and that good intent uh, doesn't suffice. 
and that you really do have to uh, come up with more specific strategies and initiatives uh, to try to achieve a result. And even if you, in comparison perhaps to some others, you might be looking uh, okay uh, in terms of the overall universe of what we're trying to accomplish. I don't think there's any organization, be it a public one or a private one, uh, that's where it needs to be. You know, so uh, you know, certainly what, what we've tried to do uh, in that regard, you know, to segue into um, you know, beyond those who are managing our money, you know, obviously a big part of our portfolio is uh, public equity. So we're we're an owner, we're a shareholder with so many companies. And we've really um, you know, always had a pretty active corporate engagement. Uh, uh, agenda, and I have to say, we we regularly partner with uh, Calpers and Calsters, and when we put our uh, our weight together, it, it has a great impact. And, and certainly, what we saw at Exxon, not that we're going to talk about climate today, but the uh, the success of the three of the four engine one slate, you know, I think was a credit to California and New York teaming up and sending a strong message. So, in terms of the DEI agenda, you know, this is another area where you know, we all need to step up and do more. You know, part of what we look at uh, is certainly the boards of directors, you know, the leadership of the companies that we invest in and been very clear, you know, that on a host of measures, uh, significant underrepresentation with regard to racial and ethnic minority groups, only about 12 and a half percent. When you look at the largest uh, publicly traded companies in terms of the diversity in black directors, only about 4% in one of the last studies that, that I saw. So, you know, focusing on, again, the importance of the top at the top and the leadership at the top. Uh, board diversity uh, has been a, a key issue in terms of not only placing more diverse board members, but what are your, you know, what, what are your strategies? What are your policies? How do you recruit board members, you know, and, and really ensuring more accountability in that regard? You know, so we do that, obviously, the traditional ways of communicating, and if you don't get a good result, then uh, filing a shareholder proposal. And we've seen some you know, success in that area. We, we did a proposal at First Community Bank Shares on diversity, particularly with regard to the board, received 70% vote in favor. So we're very pleased uh, about that. And uh, you know, we've continued to target a number of, of, of companies uh, in this regard. Uh, I do want to mention you know, one of, a new, one of the new strategies uh, that we've been looking at is, is the notion of compelling uh, companies we own, have ownership in, to do a, um, an equity audit, to look internally, to do an independent uh, audit in that regard. And we, we chose as our first effort uh, Amazon. Amazon has obviously played an outsized role in all of our lives of, of late. And we were pleased, although our proposal didn't uh, win for them to do an independent uh, diversity and equity uh, audit. Proposal won about 44% of shareholder vote. And when you take out the shares that were controlled by Mr. Bezos, we actually did have a majority uh, in our favor. And, you know, Amazon is big and growing. The, there have been many reports about how uh, certain workers have been treated, not just from a labor perspective, but you look at the warehouse workforce, which is largely back black and brown, particular issues there, how some of the business operations located in communities of color with some negative impacts. So we felt it really was an appropriate question. And now what we're looking at is other uh, companies to target in that regard. But I do think, you know, not to get ahead of where you said we were going to go, data becomes the important question. And, and, you know, that's certainly where uh, getting more standardized data, particularly with, a, I think, a larger role for the SEC uh, to mandate that this kind of disclosure uh, and to get press companies to, uh, to give us information, certainly their EEO1 um, data would, would help us uh, make more informed judgment and choices about what our, what our next steps need to be in that regard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, actually, Tom, that's a perfect setup for uh, conversation. So um, I'm going to flip it over to Ron because State Street has done quite a, a bit this past, I guess, year plus as well on, um, on uh, engaging companies to talk about their risks, goals, strategies um, related to ethnic and racial diversity, including, you know, setting some pretty pointed requests of companies. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, that initiative uh, and how that's that's been working out? Yeah, and I, I would begin by 
saying that the the initiative is is not new. I mean, stewardship, um, as Tom has alluded to, is 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 quite important. And if you think about it, we're the we're simply the agents uh, of of the of the New Yorks, the UAWs, the Calpers, the Calsters, the world. Uh, it's not our money, uh, and we work on behalf of those uh, of those clients and those owners of capital, because. Uh, a large proportion of our uh, assets are index assets. And if you think about index assets, it's the closest thing to permanent capital in public markets. Um, as long as a company is in the index, uh, we will be invested in it. Um, I always say that as much as I may dislike any one company, I don't have the ability to turn the S&P 500 into the S&P 499, right? We have to stay invested in it. So stewardship has always been quite important. And we have a history of, of stewardship on uh, on various uh, issues going back, but with it's always really with governed by a couple of things. One is it's about value, not our values. Those two may coincide, but whatever my values are, uh, that's not, or our values are, that's actually not the point. It's what we, and Tom has alluded to this earlier, um, it's what we believe will drive uh, long-term shareholder value. Uh, by definition, it's long-term because it's, it's as long as it's in the index. And the other uh, element of this of our stewardship philosophy is, is that, again, as Tom pointed out, you start with the board, right? Uh, we may think we're the smartest people in the world, but ultimately where we can get the most traction is ensuring that boards are exercising independence and proper oversight of management. Um, so it's with those principles that um, over the past couple of years, as we focused on um, uh, first on gender, uh, on gender equity, where there was a lot of empirical work done and our view, we came of the view that we just had to lean into this a whole lot more. So going back five, six years ago, uh, particularly given some of the studies that have come out, we focused on uh, on, on gender equity, gender representation. Similarly, we've done the same thing on uh, black and brown representation for the same reasons. As the empirical studies were starting to come out, in fact, companies that are more diverse, and by the way, this is intuitive. Um, you don't really need an empirical study, but it's uh, that more diversity leads to better outcomes. So as a consequence, uh, we have actually put out uh, what we call guidance to firms and what the guidance is meant to be it's, it's primarily for boards and it's the things that we'll be looking for as evidence of both this uh independence that i talked about and that the board is exercising uh, proper and strong oversight to the extent that that doesn't occur again the divestment often isn't a tool for us um so we engage and to the extent to which the engagement uh isn't working then we will use the vote uh, and we'll use the vote either in a targeted way towards particular chairs of particular committees, right, to send that message, or as part of a of a shareholder proposal, as, as Tom was giving examples earlier. Yeah, I mean, I thought that it was really interesting because, I mean, you're saying that, you know, if a company does not have a diverse director, for example, you're voting against the chair of the NomGov committee. Um, similarly, you're looking for companies to, you know, report their EEO1 data um, or provide the underlying data, which is, you know, pretty, that's, that's a pretty clear um, support and of the need for that information. Um, and Tom, I, you know, similarly, your proxy voting policies also reflect, right? Um, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, picking up what Ron said, uh, you know, I, I think he touched on an important point. Going back a number of years ago, we were part of the 30% coalition mm -hmm. and many other uh, public funds were part of that as well. The, the focus on more women on boards absolutely has had an impact over the past four, five, six years. There's no doubt about it. Fast forward to 2020 and 2021, it was a fair question to say, uh, shouldn't we make the same priority as far as racial uh, and ethnic diversity as well? And, and you know what, we realized we needed to step up our game in that regard. So we had, going back a number of years, voted against boards that did not include uh, at least w one woman and, and hopefully more, uh, voting against uh, nominating committees and so on. And, and now we've amended our policies to include a very clear emphasis on racial and ethnic 
uh, representation, minority representation as well. So last year, we actually withheld support from about 227 incumbent directors at 55 companies. And, you know, again, you know, we, we, we wrote to uh, last summer, uh, but 72 of, of uh, the S&P companies that were invested in that had no racial or ethnic minority representation on their boards, questioning what's going on. 63% responded, and, and of those, about 32% made a commitment to add at least one uh, racial uh, or ethnic diverse uh, board member. So, you know, these kinds of efforts are important. We've updated our policies to be more explicit. We're using that shareholder vote. You know, uh, just as Ron said, you know, we're, we're, we're a passive investor with most of our public holdings. We're not going anywhere. Uh, and, and I think, that, you know, as more funds, certainly CalPERS and CalSTRS, playing a leading role as well in the union funds, we should mention that as well, UAW and others. That's how you move corporate America. So, you know, we made some progress. We have a long way to go, uh, but ownership makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, Ron, I think last, last uh, close to last question for you, and then I'm gonna ask a kind of a, a see what you uh, have to leave with the audience. But um, so, you know, Tom was just talking about engagement with companies and I know we were just talking about the guidance that State Street released, proxy voting policies. Um, State Street also sent a letter to companies, um, which we kind of talked about a little bit, but just kind of curious, what, what has the response been um, to State Street's efforts from, um, from its portfolio companies, companies that uh, you're managing on behalf of, uh, of the allocators? Oh, I, I would say that the response has actually been quite strong. And mm -hmm. as Tom notes, um, the, the, the shareholder community um, has been down this road before mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to women. And I think that uh, what boards have learned is shareholders are serious about this. So I, I would actually say that the response has been more prompt and stronger um, than it was if you go back seven, eight years ago when we had a similar push uh, to see more gender equity on boards. Um, I would say that um, that there's some of the usual um, excuses that that you're hearing that you know we're trying we we you know we can't find people you know we're we're, we're not going uh, about that and that was the same thing we'd heard back uh, around gender and our response is this is that um, if you're stuck in the traditional ways of hiring whether it's managers or board members. Then you're going to get the traditional solution, mm -hmm. right? You're going to get, you know, if, if you're looking around the table and say, "Who do you know?" Well, you're going to get who they know, which often won't be a diverse uh, and, and rich mix of people. So uh, it, it does require more work, but it is not impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also asked for responses on uh, on how they're working with management on that. And and again, they're very very good response boards are starting to act and act quickly on this. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Well, we have about a minute ish left. Um, so I'm going to start with Ron, you know, do you have any final insights for for our audience today that you'd like to leave us with? Um, I, I think what I would like to leave the audience with is um, I think most boards actually want to do the right thing. Um, I think um, many of them aren't equipped yet. And mm -hmm. I think what's incumbent upon all of us is sessions like this. Um, but doing what we can to help educate board members. Uh, we're actually doing a little bit of work with the Ford Foundation and others on how, you know, how lead directors are thinking about this and what are best practices that we can do. And um, I think that's a role that the investment community can play here in terms of uh, upskilling, if you will, boards on this, on this problem. Great. Thank you, Ron. And Tom, same question to you. Um, any final insights for the audience? I agree with what Ron just said, and I, I would just offer a view of optimism. I, I, I really think we are at a, uh, a time where momentum is building for systemic change. I think that uh, the investment world could be a key part of leading that, the corporate world as well. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Let's keep collaborating, sharing uh, strategies and thoughts, and uh, we will get to a better day. Sure. Well, Thank you both for uh, joining us today and for an insightful session. Um, now we're going to take a short break and uh, reconvene uh, at 10.30 a.m. So thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.
Thanks, Cambria. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks.